Been sleeping for too long. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. I see the sunshine gazing through the window pane. Blazing like endo flame. It's time to wake up. Come to your senses, man. Snow is all around you, but you don't play in the winter game. Cartridges surround you, but you ain't playing Nintendo games. Load them up. Greetings and welcome back to the Woke Podcast. I am your host, Brandon Jones, and on today's episode, we have an action-packed interview featuring Muhammad S. Lawimba, who's also known as Muhammad Speaks, and this brother brought the heat on today's episode. Man, let me tell you, prepare yourself because you're going to get a lot of constructive information. Uh, your blood pressure is going to rise a little bit, and you might get motivated and inspired to go out there and do some critical work. Uh, we discuss various different social and economic issues that impact uh, black youth, um, more specifically black males. But whenever you're talking about black males, you're also talking about black females and the black community in general. Um, so we, we just dive into that. Mr. Muhammad, he uh, recently just passed the bar. So he's also going to be um, a lawyer. He is a lawyer. I should say he's not going to be. Uh, but he does a lot of work with black male juveniles, um, black males who come in contact with the juvenile justice system system uh and he's and he's trying to figure and he's putting out constructive work he's not trying to figure it out he has figured out some key and critical elements to this you know complex puzzle we're trying to piece together when it comes to black folks and moving us in the right direction so uh he has an organization entitled elite brother um he also had put out a very constructive uh audio book by the same title and he also has a companion uh, organization elite uh sister as well so check out the interview as always be sure to share it with someone you care about and be sure to subscribe to the podcast be safe be constructive be woke tune in and let's get into the interview all right so we're live now okay um so greetings welcome for coming on to the woke podcast uh i have mr muhammad speaks on the line um, full name is Muhammad Lawimba, right? That yes, my name is my full name is Muhammad Lawimba. Uh, Lawimba. All right, perfect. So, can you tell folks who you are, um, what you do, and and yeah, who you are, what you do, and where you're at? Okay, my name is uh, Muhammad Lawimba. I am in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I'm a recently barred attorney. Uh, passed the July bar. I got my results back in October. Awesome. Um, I'll be getting, thank you. I'll be getting sworn in actually, um, December 28th. And basically, uh, currently I do case management, um, at a particular juvenile facility down here for the department of juvenile justice, but mainly my work in the community consists of building black boys into black men via my organization, elite brother Inc. And our don't go to prison initiative. So really what I do is, is once these young brothers get out of juvenile, what I do is try to help them transition into productive citizens in society. And we try to go around from, to different schools and different college campuses and let these youth give their experiences to other youth about how easy it was for them to get in trouble, um, how hard it was for them to get out of it, their experiences in the juvenile facility. And we try to approach the, the juvenile justice system and this epidemic of incarceration amongst black male and female youth holistically. The main thing we try to do is when they get out is give them opportunities to make money legitimately and not just have them get out and learn how to fill out a job application and get a job, but have them get out and learn some skills where they can make their own money and be entrepreneurs because we I really believe that economic empowerment is one of the main keys to uplifting our community in all areas, socially, politically, um, economically, and morally. Because a lot of these young men and women in these juvenile facilities, 90% of their crimes are economic crimes. Most of the young men that I run into are in there for armed robbery. Rarely do I see a young brother incarcerated in juvenile for murder or for rape or or uh, um, just stealing something. Most of the time it's armed robbery, carjacking, something to get finances. And a lot of times it's because they don't have the uh, wherewithal to get money in a legitimate way because they aren't in contact with people that have diverse means of income because a lot of times brothers that do quote unquote make it out of the hood or whatever and find different ways to make money don't go back and teach these young guys. So what I try to do is with my programs in the juvenile facilities and high schools and in the community is teach them alternative ways to get money that's going to keep them out of uh, the juvenile system and incarceration in general. Awesome. Yes. So how did you get into um, 
this work? Like what led you to, you know, do case management, which is not an easy job. I used to be a case manager for transitional housing. So working with homeless youth um, to the point where you went to go to law school and uh, become a lawyer as well. So how did you get involved into this work? Well, basically, I kind of stumbled into it. Um, I've always been involved in the community in high school and in college. But when I was just graduated from um, college in Detroit, Michigan in 2006, I got a job at a private youth prison. It was ran by uh, a private agency. So first I started working in abuse and neglect. And then I moved to a youth prison. And I just really saw that these young guys were getting railroaded. Yeah. I mean, three, three and four years for st- burglarizing houses, three and four years for stealing cars. And don't get me wrong, you do the crime, you should do the time. But it's a such thing as the punishment fitting the crime. And so a lot of times these guys were getting incarcerated and getting these long sentences simply because they didn't have um, good attorneys. They didn't have good representation. And even where I cur- I'm currently employed, I work in the city of Atlanta, but most of these guys that are incarcerated at my job and in adult prisons throughout the country aren't from big cities. They're from these small towns like LaGrange, Georgia, Mm -hmm. Forsyth, Georgia, Bainbridge, Georgia, where they have one juvenile judge, one public defender, one prosecutor. They're all white and there's really no oversight. So these small towns are a feeder system for young black males going into the juvenile justice system and eventually going to adult prison. And what I found with a lot of these youth where a lot of these youth, it's not that they're dumb. It's not that they uh, um, are just bad people. A lot of them just don't have positive role models and mm-hmm. because youth want positive role models. And the reason why I know that is I can sit there and point in the youth face and cuss them out and tell them to pull your pants up and do the right thing, and they'll say, yes, Mr. Muhammad, you're right. And they won't say anything disrespectful to me. And the reason why is because they don't want to disappoint me. And I found with a lot of these youth, the reason why they're dropping out of school, the reason why they're making bad grades is because, like, when I was growing up, I knew if I made bad grades, people were going to be disappointed. Mom was going to be disappointed. Dad was going to be disappointed. Uncles, aunts, big sisters, big brothers. But they don't care about making bad grades. They don't care about getting suspended from school because nobody's going to be disappointed because mom is working. Dad isn't in the home big brothers out doing the same thing they're doing or incarcerated. So once these youth have someone that they feel cares about them and someone that they know is going to be disappointed if they aren't productive, it it makes them, it gives them some positive reinforcement to do something positive. And so what I try to do is be that positive male role model and let them know, hey, you don't have to be a basketball player. You don't have to be a rapper. You don't have to um, sell drugs to be a positive person. And when you start showing these youth alternative ways to make money, they jump on it. And I tell them all the time, the only difference between them and a Mark Zuckerberg who founded Facebook is that Mark Zuckerberg's parents had the wherewithal to put him in coding classes when he was in high school in an elementary school. Right. So if these kids had someone to put them in coding classes when they're in high school and elementary school or had someone teaching them about the stock market in high school and elementary school, they would be trying to pursue finances that way. But because they don't have anyone teaching them that and White supremacy weaponizes everything, including the media, which I think has been uh, um, the best and most effective weapon against the the, the disenfranchisement of black youth. All they see in the media, they don't see brothers like you on TV. They don't see brothers like me on TV. They see drug dealers, basketball players. And if they don't see drug dealers and basketball players, if they do see a positive brother that's doing right, he's either whitewashed or Uncle Tom or married to a white woman. And so a lot of times these brothers say, okay, I don't want to be any of that. And if I can't be a basketball player, if I can't be a rapper, what can I do right now to emulate the only ways I see I can get money? That's go to the street. And so my job right now is to meet the youth where they are. Like a lot of these youth are in gangs and whatnot. And I found that the gang structure can actually be used to help the youth if used correctly. So what I actually do is, is when these youth get out, I try to organize them and bring them into our organization because they used to organization. They used to a chain of command. They used to discipline because they have to be that way to be a part of their street organizations. So what I do is, is I take that same structure and base it around something positive around as opposed to around something negative. And most of the time, 99% of the time, it's kind of like the honorable Elijah Muhammad said, if you offer someone a dirty glass of water and a clean glass of water, they're going to drink out of the clean glass of water. 
But if they're thirsty and their only option is a dirty glass of water, they're going to drink that dirty glass of water. So what I try to do is with our organization, offer them two choices. Here's a clean glass. There's the dirty glass. You see what a dirty glass got you. And most of the time they will drink out of that clean glass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So you brought up a really key point. And when I do the work that I do, I'm a psychotherapist by trade. Um, so I do a lot of groups with young men who are in and out of the juvenile you know, correction system on one level or another in their families. And, one of the, and when I go out and I train professionals, um, I, I, usually, I set them up. So one of the things I say is we don't need any more mentoring programs in the black community. And, <laughs> and that's a right. setup question because automatically, because that's what we're given, right? That's what's funded through the government. That's where all these grants are coming in is mentoring. But as, as we've seen over the past 30 some odd years, mentoring has not been a, a key for us collectively. So the reason why I say we don't need more mentors, I say we need more models and apprenticeships in our in our community. And mentoring is a, a subsection of those two things. And that's why I see kind of where you're going and what you're saying is we need folks who are, you know, doing the most constructive thing that they can do on a daily basis where our youth can see these things. And then the mentoring piece kind of comes afterwards. And the reason why I say mentoring is not necessarily something that we need is the model of mentoring that we're given is not effective for what we're dealing with our, our situation. So we have this model. I don't know if the, I'm, I'm assuming it's like this across the country, but from where I've seen in, in the Midwest here, I'm in uh, the twin cities of many uh, Minnesota. Um, okay. the, the model is, you know, you have somebody meet with a young person once, maybe twice a week, they take them to McDonald's or take them to the park or they help with homework. And then for about an hour or so, and then they bounce. And that's not, that's not, you know, solving any of the problems, but we need someone who's actually showing people the ropes. How do they make money? How did you get to this point in time in your career or in your, in your business or what you do for a living? Um, how do you, how do you fix certain things? You know, how do you become a man or a young lady? Um, how do you do these things? We need more apprenticeships versus just mentors. And I think mentoring is a part of that solution, but not necessarily the solution. And right. that often gets that often gets pushed. Um, another part of that, another thing that you said, and I want to see what your perspective is on this, is that you talked about using gang structure as a positive kind of reinforcement. Uh, one of the things that uh, we see here in the Twin Cities, we get a lot of folks from Detroit, a lot of folks from Chicago. That's probably the main hub where black folks come up from is Chicago, Milwaukee. And get, the gangs are different. So, when, you know, I was born in the mid 80s when the gangs were popping, when I was, you know, a baby, it was a different structure. Now we have more of what we call clicks. We have click mm -hmm. bangers. And I don't know if they had that down in Atlanta, um, but we have more click bangers. So people, you know, they'll represent based off the block they live on. Um, they might have a common interest. Uh, it, it could be regional, but it's not necessarily like Bloods, Crips, GDs, Vice Lords. It's not necessarily that. One of the things that I've seen with these click bang, these click, that's what we call them click bangers. They don't have OGs. It's, right. a, it's a bunch of young dudes just out here hungry, doing whatever they need to do to survive together. And they see each other as brothers, and they built a collective, a family, but they don't have any type of OGs providing any guidance. And I remember back when I was young and being recruited to be in gangs and stuff, OGs, even though we were doing stuff that we probably shouldn't have been doing, OGs were still giving us game. They were giving us constructive information. Go to school. You know, if you are going to be out here doing this, at least get, get your, you know, graduate from high school at least. What, what do you, do you see that as an issue is no OGs, no guidance, no older people really helping young folks who are involved in criminal or gang uh, activity, kind of showing them the ropes of life? Well, you're right. I actually, I'm from Atlanta, but I grew up in Detroit. I went to high school gotcha. and college in Detroit. Gotcha. Um, and you're right. It's really a click thing, but that all, it all goes back to white supremacy, weaponizing everything. And let me tell you why I say that. Mm -hmm. When I moved to Detroit in 96 um, from Atlanta, there were no gangs in Atlanta. Mm. We didn't, we weren't known as a city with Crips, Bloods, GDs, Vice Lords, and all of that. There were really no gangs in Detroit when I moved to Detroit. You had crews from different neighborhoods. Right. right. Now in Atlanta, you got a lot of Bloods, you got mm. a lot of GDs, same thing with, with Detroit. That's why when I say white supremacy weaponizes everything, that's what I mean. You see the rise of these gangs in these cities where gangs aren't traditional. And when I say traditional, I'm talking about outside of Chicago and L.A. Right. You see a rise of it in really 2005, 2006, when gang-banging rap became big. The Source magazine did, a, did a, 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 a cover magazine with the game on the cover called 
the rise of the bloods. Mm. Ne- next thing you know is blood sets everywhere. Um, um, mm-hmm. All over the South, all over the East Coast. New York didn't traditionally have gangs until mm-hmm. after the until after the East Coast West Coast beef with with the um, with, with the rappers on the on the West Coast. And so now you have all these gangs in all these different cities that don't know the the traditional background of the gang culture in the Chicago or the gang culture in the L.A. And so now you have you're right. You have all these kids that are saying that they're gang members and emulating what they think. A gangster is supposed to do right you know and they don't have any older people um, um, telling them say hey go to school or try to organize or, or or try to be you know the best person that you can be their so-called OGs are 15 16 year olds just like them right you know <laughs> and, 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 and another and another thing about that is I'm, a, I'm I really believe strongly that um, a lot of the people in these so-called gangs are agents mm. that are put into black communities to um, uh, uh, to cause dissent, put in the black communities to cause criminal activity. I tell the guys at my at, at my facility where I work all the time. You watch that guy in your neighborhood that's always got something bad for you to do. Always want to put you on to selling drugs. Always robbing. Always in the street. But he don't never seem to go to jail. Mm. That's a cop. Yep. He's a snitch. He's working for the police because all these kids are locked up because they friend told on them. Mm-hmm. So it's not any loyalty in this anymore. And so what I'm telling them is, is that I try to compare it to uh, um, when you look at slavery or look at white supremacy, the, the second worst thing that happened to black people in America was the influx of crack cocaine into the black community. The first worst thing was the transatlantic slave trade. And so once we start analyzing it like that, I tell the youth, Basically, what you're doing is, 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 is perpetuating white supremacy, because a lot of times when we think about Uncle Tom's, we think about people like Clarence Thomas, uh, Sheriff Clark out of Milwaukee, and all these uh, black faces that they put on white supremacy on Fox News. But Uncle Tom's are also these people that are tearing down the black community, the, the, the drug dealers and the gangbangers and, and, and the robbers and the rapists that happen to be black, but because the media portrays them as part of the indigenous black social construct we don't look at them as uncle toms Mm -hmm. but in reality they're uncle toms as well they're just uncle toms on another extreme so once we start looking at the enemies of our race as from a holistic approach from within and saying okay it's not just a clarence thomas that'll that'll make a supreme court decision that will have you disenfranchised for the next hundred years it's also that brother that will kill you for cartier glasses in detroit brothers are literally killing other brothers for cartier glasses my homeboy got murdered when he was 19, shot in the back of the head for his glasses. Wow. For his glasses. Another kid in January 2016 in Detroit, walking down Van Dyke on the east side, had on some Cartier glasses. It was on surveillance tape. Guy walks up to him, shoots him in the back of the head, takes the glasses off his face and run away. Wow. That is a race traitor. That's an Uncle Tom. But when, but when you look, when you ask the person what an Uncle Tom is, they'll tell you it's a black cop that'll go around killing brothers, which he is. They'll tell you that it's a, um, it's a Sheriff Clark or it's a Clarence Thomas, which they are. But what is an Uncle Tom? It's a black person that does things that are detrimental to their own community. So we got a lot of un, unclassified Uncle Toms within our community. And once we start looking at them as the enemy as well, then I think we can come up. Because right now, everything that's negative for our youth, they're taught to embrace. So they're taught to embrace materialism. They're taught to spend money instead of save money. They're taught to, um, to have sex with as many women as they can because that makes you a man, which is why HIV is so rampant in our community. So everything that is counterproductive for our youth, the media teaches them to embrace. I mean, just look at the, 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 the most popular shows in, in black America, Empire, Love, and Hip Hop, where black women are objectified, and the black women in those shows base a man's standing in society based on how much money he has. And the men um, um, just dog sisters, and they talk about pimping and, and sleeping with as many women as they can. Or, 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 and it's just a combative relationship between black men and black women on these shows. But these are the shows that our youth are watching. It's not like when me and you were growing up where we had shows like Family Matters, Cosby Show, A Different World, um, um, Boy Meets World. Uh, um, family ties. We had all these black shows that showed positive images of black people, and those were the most popular shows on TV when we were growing up. Yeah. So now the most popular shows on TV amongst our youth are Basketball Wives, Love and Hip Hop, and Empire. So by the time a black girl is 15 years old, she think niggas ain't shit. And by the time a black boy is 15 years old, he think bitches ain't shit. Yep. 
And when they say niggas ain't shit, who they talking about? Black men. When brothers say bitches ain't shit, who they talking about? Black women. That's why I asked some kids at my job the other day, when you think of a stripper, what do you think? What's the first image that come to your mind? They were like, you know, a, 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 a fine ass sister with a black ass, mm-hmm. with, a, with a fat ass. Mm-hmm. So the average black male in America, when the word stripper comes to mind, a Chinese woman don't come to their mind. An right. Arab woman don't come to their mind. A white woman don't come to their mind. Uh, um, um, a Japanese or Australian woman don't come to their mind. A black woman come to their mind. But why is that? Because 99% of the images of strippers they see on TV and in the, and on the internet and on Instagram are black women. When you ask a sister, when you think a drug dealer, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? A white man don't come to their mind. Asian man don't come to their mind. Uh, um, um, and no other race come to their mind. Arab is a brother. Mm-hmm. So we associate negative terms with our own people because that's all that we are seeing. And, 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 and it's unfortunate, and that's something that we, that we have to combat. And that's why I'm a big proponent of just, just cutting the damn TV off. Yeah, <laughs> for real. You know? Yeah. And I mean, and with the advent of social media and how, you know, how necessary it has become in all of our lives, you know, even if we do cut the TV off, they're still going to get that same programming just on their timelines. I mean, yeah. A, a lot of folks are learning from memes now. Like a lot of the young people that <laughs> that I talk to when I'm giving them constructive information, they're always like, man, I seen this meme that said something like that. And I'm like, you got, you got to do a little bit more research than just seeing, you know, one image that's portraying some information to you that you need to further check out. Now, it might be true. Don't don't think that all memes are incorrect. But at the same time, don't just run off what you see on a meme. And that happens a lot, man. I, I remember running into that on a pretty much on a daily basis in the work that I do. Well, our youth don't read. Exactly. It, it's, it's, un- it's unfortunate. Our youth don't read. I mean, in, when, I, when I give the youth books like Stock Market for Dummies or The 48 Laws of Power, it's like opening up a whole new world for them. Like, wow, I didn't even know this. I didn't even – and they love reading. And it's unfortunate. I hate – why do brothers have to get locked up to start opening up books? Man. You know what I mean? I yeah. know so many bro- young kids that when they get locked up, they become voracious readers. Mm-hmm. But why did you have to get locked up to do that? You know what I mean? Would you even like a lot of these kids tell me, man, Mr. Muhammad, if I would have met you before I got locked up, I would have never got locked up. Then I say, would you have even listened to me mm. <laughs> right now? You don't have a choice but to listen to me. You're not on drugs. You're not drinking. You're not smoking. You don't got nothing to do. I have a captive audience. But if I would have approached you on the street when you was high off that loud or that line of cocaine or chasing that girl, would you even have listened to me? And that's why it's very important for me to deal with these brothers in the juvenile facilities because when they come home, they're the leaders in their community. That's why we got to use negativity and try to turn it into something positive. They're leaders in their community because, unfortunately, they've been locked up so so they're looked up to. So when they come home, if I can change their mindset, they can change the mindset of their whole crew. Mm-hmm. They can say, hey, listen to Mr. Muhammad. This, listen to this guy. A lot of guys that are locked up right now, I know a lot of 17-year-olds, that day they turned 17, they went to start their prison sentence. But these guys are calling home saying, it's a guy named Mr. Muhammad. I'm sending him to the community. Listen to him. So now I don't have to give myself an introduction when I come to certain neighborhoods because I know they big brothers. I know they uncles. I know they cousins because I've been doing this for a long time. So they're calling from prison saying, listen to this guy. That's why it is so important to, to, to get involved with that prison class, to get involved with that juvenile delinquent class, because those are the leaders amongst these youth. A lot of things that happen on the street come from the penitentiary because all the big time gangsters in prison. Yep. So that's why it's so important to, 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 to get involved with that prison class and go to those prisons and talk to those brothers in those juvenile facilities and talk to those brothers because those are the guys that's running crews on the street. And those are the guys that can give that introduction and say, hey, you know, what this guy is saying is the truth. Listen to him. Don't go to prison uh, um, and, and, and try to make yourself a better person because, unfortunately, the brothers in college, like when I went to law school, I used to try to get brothers all the time to say, you know, hey, come to this juvenile facility and talk to you young guys or come in the community with me. They're not worried about that. They're worried about getting their law degrees, passing that bar, and making a bunch of money. They're not worried about mm. giving back to the community. You know what I mean? Um, the same thing with the females. It's, 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 it's not any young black women mentoring in these female juvenile facilities. Man. And black, black girls in juvenile are just a forgotten demographic. Yes, and it's increasing like crazy. Yes. It's, here in Minnesota, that's the number one increased uh, population is girl, juvenile girls. Yeah. Yeah, and then black women for adults. <laughs> it's like, damn. Mm-hmm. 
and they're being criminalized more too. Um, I work in schools a lot, and when we look at suspension numbers, especially in public schools, uh, black girls have the highest rate of suspensions because of fighting and things that they see on Bad Girls Club and Love and Hip Hop, pretty much arguing. Yeah, things. yeah. Wow. Uh, are you familiar with Dr. Amos Wilson? I've heard of the brother. Yes, I haven't okay. um, researched his work, but I've heard of him. Okay, because because what you were speaking of reminds me of one of the books that he wrote called Black on Black Violence: The Psychodynamics of Black Self Annihilation in Service of White Domination. And mm-hmm. and this and and you know pretty much the first chapter of the book talks about kind of what you were saying about the social political necessity of black criminality and how. Um, it's ne- it's necessary for this American system to keep rolling for black folks to be criminalized. And also he talks about the level of um, interest for people to do these criminal activities. It's based off of finances. A lot of our criminals have bourgeois mentalities. Like they're out here robbing folks to get the same things that we work for, the quote unquote black professionals work for. So they want the house, they want the car, they want the money, they want, you know, they want nice things. And that's why they're out here doing these activities. They just don't have the means to get them. So they result into doing what's considered to be criminal activity. Right. Right. You have, you absolutely, you absolutely right about that. And, and, a lot of times the the reason why is because th- these youth, I tell them all the time, the American dream wasn't meant for you to be rich at 20. Mm. And they want it now. Yep. Nothing beats long, nothing beats long hours and hard work. You can get a bankroll by working a lot. I mean, I, I mean, these kids are getting locked up for years. I know kids doing 10, 20 years in prison because they robbed somebody for a cell phone. Mm. Wow. Now, what type of self-esteem do you have to have? It has to be so low to where you're willing to risk 10, 20 years of your life just so you can be seen with the iPhone or just so you can be seen with a pair of Cartier glasses. Because I, I got kids at my job. I robbed somebody, and, and, and um, I got $1,000, and, and how much time you get? I got a year locked up in juvenile for robbing somebody. Okay, you got a year, and you lucky they dropped you down to juvenile because they can charge you as an adult for that. Okay, you got a year. You got $1,000. 365 days in a year. Break that down. You basically made two dollars and some change a day. Mm. You could have worked at Kroger and in a month made that. Mm. But because they want it now, because the media teaches them to spend money instead of save money. Oh, let's go and, and throw a bunch of money in the air at the strip club like black people got it like that. We party like we got it like that. So a lot of these black youth, they don't want to be rich. They just want to be perceived as being rich. This is why you see on Instagram the brokest kids on the planet holding up a wad of ones with a $100 bill on the top because they want to be perceived as having money. They want to, and it's all based on a low self-esteem. So after I rob somebody for those glasses, rob somebody for that iPhone, and I feel good for two or three days, and I realize, wow, this doesn't make me feel like a better person. I got to keep robbing. I got to keep stealing to refill my, the empty gas tank of self-esteem that I'm lacking. And so what it is is these kids think that they're, 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 they're worth as a human being is worth material possessions, is the material possessions, not my education, not how well I treat people, not how I carry myself, but the kind of shoes I got on, the, 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 the kind of glasses I got on. And it's very hypocritical in America. We in Christmas time right now, the holidays, and in a time where it's supposed, and, and Christmas is some bullshit anyway, but in a time where it's supposed to be about love and about giving and whatnot, this is the time where crime increases in America by 100%. Mm. Why? Because criminals, or not even criminals, but young brothers want to ha- want to have new clothes to go back to school with, so they're willing to rob. Mothers who want to give to their children are willing to go on the street and buy stolen goods, which increases the demand for stolen goods because they want their kids to look like the other kids when they go back to school, which is very hypocritical because that's not what Christmas is supposed to be about. But in this time, crime increases significantly because it's not about God. It's not about, quote, unquote, Jesus Christ. It's not about giving. It's about uh, um, receiving and looking good and going back to school with some new clothes. Right. You know, and, 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 it, and, it's, very, and it's very unfortunate. And as long as – and a lot of this has to do with that – I don't have a daddy at home syndrome, and I see a lot of that with the with the um, with the youth that I work with. If if uh, if you're a black male without a father, and you raised by women like a lot of our youth are, and your mom loves Little Wayne, your mom loves Young Jeezy, your mom loves 
um, um, whatever one of these rappers is who I believe I pay agents, paid to specifically misguide our youth. Your mom loves Rick Ross. Your mom loves Big Meech. And you're a boy that doesn't have a father, and you're a heterosexual and you like women. What's going to be your example of the type of men that women like? Yep. The type of men that the women in your family like. So if my mama like Lil Wayne and Lil Wayne pretending to be a blood and talking about selling drugs when he ain't never sold no dope in his life and he's not a real blood, if my mama loved young Jeezy that constantly brags about how he made his first million selling crack, if my mom loves uh, Rick Ross who named himself after someone that aided and abetted in the second genocide of black people, um, um, which is the influx of crack cocaine, well, damn, I want women to like me too. So I want to be like the men that my mom loves or that my sisters love or that the women in my community love. It's not brothers like Mr. Muhammad Luamba that's coming to the juvenile facility uh, um, trying to help us. It's not the brother that, that – um, is the lawyer trying to fight for our community. It's not brothers like you. It's not a, it's not a brother that, that, that might be the garbage man that might not have a lot of money, but he work hard every day and he's staying out of jail, and you're never going to be Lil Wayne, so what am I going to do? I'm going to mimic that. So even though I can't be a millionaire rapper, I'm going to join the blood gang. Even though I can't be a millionaire rapper, I'm going to sell some dope because I'm going to try to emulate what I see the women in my community like. And not to say all black women are like that, but a lot of sisters who have had children young those are the type of brothers that they're going for. And so a lot of times in our community, because women set the standard in the black community because the black male as a man has been socially castrated. So women, black women lead our community. They set the standard, unfortunately, and that shows something that, that shows how backwards our race is that women are leading it. Because I believe that the men should be the standard bearer in the community and women should be our helpmate, our backbone, because our greatest ally in this fight against white supremacy is the black woman and their greatest ally in the fight against white supremacy is the black male. But because women lead the community, if black women overnight change their philosophy and said, we're not going to date drug dealers. We're not going to date brothers with their pants sagging. We're not going to date brothers that drop out of school. We're not going to date brothers that's out here robbing and carjacking and calling women bitches and hoes and, 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 and disrespecting sisters. Overnight, brothers would change their tune because 90% of the things these boys do, they're doing it to impress females. Yep, yep. So a lot of, a lot of that's why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said 75% of my work is with the black woman. <laughs> Elijah yeah. Muhammad said that in the 30s. He said 75% of my work with the black woman because y'all going to do y'all going to do what she do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's so so it's, we have to we have to approach this from a holistic approach. Then on the flip side, why do sisters love drug dealers so much? Not all, but a significant amount. Why do why are so many sisters going after the pimps or the brothers in the street getting money? It goes back to what I said, economics. Even though these brothers are negative and they doing something counterproductive, they're offering an economic foundation. Mhm. Mm so we have to offer our sisters an economic foundation. Sisters don't like bad boys because they're bad. They like bad boys because even though they're out here doing wrong, they're getting money and they're offering an economic foundation. We have to start offering an economic foundation to our sisters before they get out here and start doing what a lot of sisters are starting to do and start bed winching for white men. You know what I mean? Because the white man is going to offer that economic foundation. Mm -hmm. So we have to offer an economic foundation, not just for the sisters, but for the young brothers. That's why I'm so focused on getting money. That's why I own several businesses. That's one of the reasons I became a lawyer, not just to get brothers out of jail, but to get money, to show these youth, yeah, you like the shoes I got on, you like the watch I got on, you like the car I drive. Let me show you how I did it. And I didn't do it by selling no dope. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let me let me let me let me show you how I did this. That's why we have to have an economic foundation, which is why in the in people ask me all the time, why do we have so much um, 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 uh, unadulterated, unfiltered black leadership in the late 50s, 60s, and 70s, and right now the black leadership is bland, to say the least. Um, and the reason why is because back in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s, we were segregated. Most black people worked for other black people, worked for themselves, because we really couldn't get a job in the white community. So if I speak out against white supremacy, I'm not worried about losing my job because when I speak out against white supremacy, I work with other black people. I work for a black person. So I'm not just speaking up for myself. I'm speaking up for my boss. I'm speaking up for my coworkers, and I'm speaking up for my community. Since integration, because most black people get a check from white people, we still know white supremacy is out here. We still know that this beast is, 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 is killing us day in and day out without no repercussions from the law. But I'm not going to speak up about it because I'm afraid to lose my job. Yeah. Yeah. I'm afraid to lose my job. So if you have an economic base, you can say whatever you want because your boss don't put food in your mouth. Mm -hmm. 
You know what I mean? And even if you do have a boss, you're speaking up for for your community. You're speaking up for your boss as well because he comes from the same community you come from. Right. Absolutely. Wow. And you had mentioned that you 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 know you own and operate several businesses, um, Elite Brother and Elite Sister. Those are two of them. Um, right. Right. Elite yeah. Brother. Uh, Elite Brother Inc. is a um, is a nonprofit organization. Um, uh, our our uh, Mission is to build simple, build black boys into black men. Elite Sister Inc. is one that we recently started. Build black women in the in the build black girls into black women, but they're also brands. So we have Elite Brother Clothing Co. and we have Elite Sister Clothing Co. Um, the website is www.elitebrothersister.com, and that's where people can go to buy the clothing from Elite Brother Clothing, and people can go buy the clothing from Elite Sister Clothing. Um, we also have the Don't Go to Prison initiative, and you can also get information uh, from uh, EliteBrotherSister.com about that, and it's the Don't Go to Prison initiative is basically going to be spearheaded by a documentary that we're doing called Don't Go to Prison, where we have exclusive cell phone footage from inside level five prisons, because I got a lot of friends in prison, and they said, hey, Muhammad, we want to be a part of this documentary. We want to let the youth know, and it's not a scared straight documentary. They're not in there doing nothing negative. It's a bunch of brothers in prison doing 20, 30, 40 years, literally looking right at that cell phone saying, this is why you don't want to go to prison. This is what happens when you come to prison. Your family forgets about you. Your girl starts having babies by your homeboys. This is how we're living in this cell. You can die in here. And we're doing interviews with brothers in the penitentiary and doing interviews with brothers that have just been released. And so the whole Don't Go to Prison initiative is based on once those brothers come home or people from juvenile come home, going from school to school, college to college, community to community, and approaching this don't go to prison thing from a holistic approach. It's not just about a documentary or trying to keep brothers out of jail. It's trying to keep brothers out of jail and giving them a reason to stay out, making sure that they understand, hey, this is, these are the resources that you need. This is how you do financial aid for college. This is how you start a business. This is how you build an app. This is how you code. And the ultimate goal of the Don't Go to Prison initiative is to build a, uh, a community center and think tank in every major um, urban area that we can in America, starting with Atlanta. And this community center is going to be basically a training facility for young black men and young black women, a literal training facility where they can go learn self-defense, they can um, um, exercise, they can learn different skills on how to make money. And, and our goal is to get vans, literally pick these kids up from school, bring them to the community center, and then at 9 o'clock drop them off at home because these kids are getting locked up after school or during school hours. So what we want to do is drain this, this juvenile system, make it so that because every single day we get new kids into the facility, we want to make it so that these facilities have to shut down because y'all not getting no more kids because y'all get paid per kid. Yep. And so if we can keep our kids off the street, the police can't come into our neighborhoods like slave cats is looking to jack our boys up and locking them up for nothing. You know, so our goal is to keep these kids off the street. So we got to open these community centers and make it somewhere where kids want to go. And like you said, it's not just a community center where a bunch of niggas come up in there and say, hey, let me help you with your homework or, or bring a Bible and a Quran in there and do some religious classes. No, it's going to be a real training facility where we actually like like you build a training set or build a, a, um, a Lego puzzle. We literally going to take these boys, take these girls and build them into black men, build them into black women. And one of the main things uh, uh, my whole agenda is is it's not going to be nothing but black men and black women working there because nobody outside of our community, uh, if, if you're not black, your opinions are about how the black people need to uplift themselves and raise our youth is irrelevant to me. Mm. You know, that's why I don't even debate with white people or, or Asian people or anybody that's not black about internal issues of the black community because your opinions are irrelevant. Just like I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't debate about what's going on in with the with the Dakota Access Pipeline because you know I'm not about to go out there and get water holes by no for no Native Americans because ain't no Native Americans gonna come and die for me or my community. I'm not about to protest for what's going on. I mean, it's sad what's going on in Aleppo and Palestine and with Syria. It's sad because they victims of white supremacy as well. But the average Arab don't give a damn about the black man in America. So you, I'm not about to go chant and protest for no Arab because they're not going to do it for us. And the Arabs come to cities like Detroit where I grew up, open up liquor stores, sell our kids single cigarettes, sell our kids alcohol, sexually harass every black woman that work in the store, sell our so-called Muslims selling our kids pork and bad meat, but they won't sell that in community you know what I mean so you, you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fight for them 
You know what I mean? We have our own fight right here. I can't, I can't overextend myself and fight for other communities, and that's a problem we as black people have. We always allow ourselves to be mascots for other yeah. communities or let other communities latch on to our movements when it's convenient for them. And then they want to go, and then when they ask, how can we help you? And I say, well, get your damn businesses out of our community. It's a problem. Mm. You know what I mean? So we, so we, have, to, we have to totally focus on our own people and, and, and really have a race-first philosophy. You know what I mean? We have to have a race-first philosophy. And until we have a race-first philosophy, you know, we're going to continue in this, in, in this downward economic uh, uh, spiral. And that's why the political climate in America right now is, is, is bad, but I have to look at it from, a, from, a, from a, um, the glass half full as opposed to the glass half empty. Right mm-hmm. now, you've got a, the, the, the white supremacists in, in America beefing with Russia. you you um, you got Russia um, 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 involved in Syria and whatnot. One thing that's not coming up in that whole discussion is black people, and that's good. That's not our fight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let them do what they that, – that's not our fight. Absolutely. What, however – I agree with you, right? But at the same time, it's important for us to keep our eyes on what's going on so we can make strategic moves as a collective. And I think that we're not. What, what I end up, and this is actually how I found you, which is interesting, mm-hmm. is it has been a very interesting kind of response that us as black folks have had since the election of Donald Trump. Um, it, w- it reminds me of when the George Zimmerman verdict came down and he was found not guilty for killing Trayvon Martin, uh, black folks seemed to get smacked in the face collectively, and there was a shock. And then we had Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, you know, we had all all these situations where we just kept getting slapped in the face. And finally, we get to this presidential election, and we get this another slap, and it was just like, when are we going to understand that this is the this is the society that we're in, and that collectively, like you said, we have to change not only our philosophy, we have to shift our culture. Mm-hmm. And and then I found you because you were speaking to this um, through one of your audio essays on SoundCloud. Uh, Musa Ali, he had posted it on Facebook. So I was like, who's this? He had shouted you out. So I checked it out, and I thought that, that you know the things that you were bringing up were very important. Could you speak towards you know what should we expect here in the next couple of weeks as President Obama gets ushered out and we have this new regime of Donald Trump? Uh, what 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 should Black folks be paying attention to? Uh, what should we be focusing on and, and how should we be conducting ourselves? Um, well, I, I don't think it's going to be a significant change for black people. I mean, the same thing that happened under Obama is probably going to be the same thing that happened under um, Donald Trump. I think that, you know, and like I said in, in my in my audio essay in regard to a 10 step plan that black people need to approach in regards to um, Donald Trump getting elected. I don't think people realize how revolutionary his campaign was because white supremacy Mm -hmm. is revolutionary in that it's able to mutate and change based on the times. Mm -hmm. It, they, they, it doesn't stay the same, you know, uh, um, it, it mutates, it changes. And so you look at a state like Ohio that haven't voted Republican in four or five decades. You look at a state like Michigan that haven't voted Republican in the past 25, 30 years. Um, uh, you look at a state like, uh, um, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, mm-hmm. states that never vote Republican or haven't in the last 25, 30 years. That was supposed to be Hillary Clinton's so-called blue wall of fire. Mm-hmm. He literally flipped Democratic states into Republican states. Now, how did he do that? People say that, you know, when he was campaigning, he said it was a silent majority of people that were going to make him win. And, and all the polls said that she was going to win. Who was this silent majority? Was it all those people at the Trump rallies with Trump signs in their yards? No, because it wasn't enough of them. And number two, they weren't being silent. That silent majority of people that supported his white supremacist campaign and white supremacist views were people that were supporting him but weren't saying it. So who were these people that changed traditionally blue states red? They're your white friends. They're your white coworkers. The white people at these hip hop con because who else were they? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Who else were they? And so what we got to realize is that you got a lot of white supremacists out here or people that sympathize with white supremacy that are thoroughly integrated into the black community that we don't think would behave that way. But they obviously did because the majority of white women and the majority of white men voted for Donald Trump. And I bring up slavery a lot. And white people hate when you bring up slavery because mm-hmm. we're the only people that's supposed to forget our own Holocaust. But <laughs> right. during slavery, 
slavery was conducted by white people who called themselves Christians. Mm. And but they still participated in the worst genocide and slavery that the world has ever produced. Why? Because white, the only God of white supremacy is maintaining and sustaining white supremacy. That's why white Christian women voted in mass for Donald Trump after he's the grab him by the pussy president. Mm-hmm. Yep. They thought that he wasn't going to get women. Why? Because white supremacy doesn't care about morality. All they care about is sustaining and maintaining and advancing white supremacy. So they will overlook all those negative things about this man. I mean, just think about it. Everything that he stands for, they say that they're against. This is a man who haven't paid federal taxes in 10, 15, 20 plus years and said it was good business. This is a man who talks about grabbing women by the quote unquote pussy. This is a man who, 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 who um, said that I could shoot somebody in the middle of Manhattan and I wouldn't lose any supporters. This is a man who, who started the lie that Barack Obama wasn't born in America simply because he's black. He was a birther. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? White people overlooked all of that because they don't care about his faults. They don't care about his, his, his shortcomings. They don't care about the fact that he's not qualified. They just care about sustaining and maintaining white supremacy, the masses of them. Just like during slavery, they don't care about that, that, that they call themselves Christians and slavery was totally against, uh, against the doctrines of Christianity. They just cared about sustaining and maintaining white supremacy. So to answer your question, what black people need to do right now mm-hmm. is, number one, make sure that we can, by any means, have our own economic base. And I'm saying something that has been said over the past 50, 60, 70, 80 years, but now is more important than ever because at this point, when you're in a situation where um, uh, your boss can dictate whether or not food goes on your table, and most black people bosses are white, when they can dictate whether or not your rent is paid, where they can dictate whether or not gas in your car, you're not the man of your house. Your boss is the man of your house. Mm. And so right now, uh, the black survival is dictated by white production. Yeah. It's dictated by white distribution. And these people have shown us in, in, in general that they don't give a damn about us, which is fine. They don't have to, you know. But once you start accosting us and start berating us and start killing us, I mean, I mean, look at the situation in New Orleans where the ex-football player got murdered by the white guy. Mm. And the police let him go that night because they said they want to do a thorough investigation, then arrested him for manslaughter. How many brothers kill somebody in broad daylight and the police let them go that night because they want to do a thorough investigation? Right. You know what I mean? Tamir Rice get rolled up on and get his brains blew out. 12-year-old black boy, no charges bought. John Crawford, brother in Walmart, standing in an aisle. White white police officer, race soldier, run up and blow his brains out. No charges bought. Fernando Castile, Alton Sterling, brothers getting legally lynched on yeah. camera. If, if we're not in a race war, then I don't know what a race war is. You know what right. I mean? And when I say a race war, I'm not talking rhetoric. Right, I'm not, right. It's not rhetoric because we in, in a race war don't have to just be physical violence. It can be they're killing us with the media. Mm-hmm. They're killing us with the radio. They're killing us economically. They're killing us, with, they're killing us more with the food that's in our communities than anything. That's why I'm a real big proponent of moving these Arabs and all these Chinese folks out of our community because why are you selling our kids 50-cent cigarettes? Mm. Why are you selling our kids liquor? Why are you selling our kids bad meat? Go to Detroit where I grew up and you, and you show me where you can find one major grocery store. You can't. Wow. You can't. It's just a bunch of nasty stores owned by Arabs and whatnot. So this is the first step. And if you listen to my Elite Brother audio book, um, I gave, a, I gave a, a five to ten step economic action plan that we as mm. black people can do. And it's simple simple things because we're going to have to feed our people in bite-sized pieces because a lot of our people is lost. You can't do it in mass. Yep. I tell sisters all the time, the first thing that y'all can do to start fighting back economically is very, very simple, and I hope sisters listening are doing, will try to implement this. Start giving yourself your own manicures and your own pedicures. Overnight, we'll put the Asian beauty uh, um, um, nail, nail business out of business. Mm-hmm. Start giving yourselves your own manicures and pedicures. Start having manicure and pedicure parties. If you can't make that sacrifice for our community, then we might as well roll over and give up now. Mm. Start giving yourself your own manicures and pedicures. Sister, that's simple. If you start doing that, all those Asian nail stores in the black community, because they have a monopoly on the nail business in the black community, will go out of business. Now, why do we want to do that? Because in warfare, 
if you can't attack your enemy effectively, you got to start attacking your enemy's allies. And all these economic leeches in the black community are allies of white supremacy. Now, the reason why I say sisters should start doing their own toes and own nails is because you tell me one business that 99% of Asian women patronize that black people own. Not one. <laughs> but you have this nail business that 99% of black women patronize that Asian people monopolize. So that's the first thing sisters can do right there. That's the first thing. Just start doing your own toes and your own nails. That's the first thing. Brothers, the first thing that brothers can do, very, very simple, and it, and it sounds hard, and I don't know why, stop buying Jordans. Mm. Just stop buying Jordans. Because we, not, we 80% of their money, just stop buying Jordans. What is that going to do? Number one, it's going to make Nike lose billions of dollars. Number two, it's going to put every other Fortune 500 company that's making billions of dollars off of black people on notice. These niggas ain't playing. Yeah. And what is Nike lobbyists going to do? What is the Chinese economic lobby going to do? They're going to inadvertently start working for us. Listen, these black folks ain't spending any money with us no more. We hurting. Something going to have to change. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a proxy war. An economic proxy war. That's why you look at, you know, they, they, and the media is funny. Like I say, they weaponize everything. They even weaponize our own leaders against us. That's why most mm -hmm. black youth, when they think about Martin Luther King, they think about the I Have a Dream speech, not knowing how revolutionary this brother was. Yeah. The most revolutionary thing Martin Luther King ever did was not be a big proponent of the so-called Civil Rights Act that was passed in 1964, 65 by uh, uh, Congress and Lyndon B. Johnson. I forgot which year. It, the most revolutionary thing, revolutionary thing he did was not the um, um, uh, uh, March on Washington, which was some bullshit. The most revolutionary thing Martin Luther King ever did was the Montgomery bus boycott where he had enough power to stop every single black man and woman from using public transportation for over a year. Yeah. Over a year. That's why he was killed, because his last two years of his life, he was just talking economics. Yep, focusing on the Now, what if, what, if, what if black people said, you know what, for a year, we're we, we not going we, we to buy no Jordans. We're not going to use um, um, public transportation. I want you to think about this. Think about the coordination that that had to take. Most black people didn't have cars in, 19, in the late 1950s in Montgomery. So you had brothers. It might be one brother on a block with a car. That got to be to work at 6 o'clock in the morning. What that brother do? That brother get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, make sure the little kids on his block get to school. Then another brother on his lunch break will come back and pick up the women from work. Then another brother on, 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 after his night shift or before his night shift will go pick up all the people from, from work that had to come home. I mean, the coordination that had to take for black people not to ride public transportation back then had to be immense, which means all black people had to be on the same page. Are we on the same page right now to, to shut down a whole city transit system? No. You, you see what I'm saying? But, but why were we on the same page back then? Because the white supremacy was blatant in our face. The media wasn't here today. You didn't have a bunch of – see, our kids watching TV, and they think because they see Kanye West and, 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 and his white whore, Kim Kardashian, that's going to screw everything that's not screwed down together, that, that we can all get along. The fact of the matter is, brother, we can't get along. Mm. We can't get along. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that – brothers should drop out of schools and that they go into or quit their job or whatever. But the best thing to combat this white supremacy is to separate and do a strategic separation. We need to live in our own communities and police our own communities. Because if we police in our own communities and we stop in the drug dealing, we stop in the gang banging and we stop in the violence, it ain't no reason for police to come in our community. So if it ain't no reason for you to come in our community, when you come, you only here to harm us. Because if we police our own communities, if our community, then police aren't in, you know why police not in white communities? Police not in white communities because they ain't, in, they ain't over there killing each other. Mm. Yeah. Police not in white communities because they ain't got a dope house set up with 50 cars coming. But they might have a dope house, but they don't run them like we run them. No, yeah. <laughs> they and got just them because up. you live, right, and just because you live in a poor community, I, I hate when people say, well, the community is like that because it's poor. Fine, our communities are poor. But just because our communities are poor don't mean they got to be dirty. Yeah. Just because the community is poor don't mean that the house got to be dilapidated. Just because the community is poor don't mean that the grass can't be cut. Just because the community is poor don't mean that, that it got to be 50 cars lined up up and down the goddamn street. Just because the community is poor don't mean that the trash ain't got to be taken out. So when I moved to Detroit in 96, I moved downtown Detroit, Cash Corridor, Heroin City, all across the boardwalk, all across the water, uh, um, John Aura, Cash Corridor, uh, Second and Prentice, Third Avenue, smoked out, cracked out, abandoned. Black people had it all to ourselves for 25, 30 years, ever since Coleman Young became the mayor. Black people had it all to ourselves. Now, 
that whole area, million dollar houses, million dollar condos, it looks mm-hmm. drop dead gorgeous. It's beautiful. We complain in saying gentrification, but yeah. you can't gentrify something when you own it. Right. So if black people would have took advantage of them buildings that were being sold for a dollar or them vacant lots that were being sold for a dollar or them buildings that they were saying, hey, just clean up the building. You got a year and you can have a title to it. If we would have took advantage of that, you can't gentrify. Only only time white people can come gentrify a community is if you don't own shit in the community. Right. That's how they come and buy up everything. But if you own it, they can't gentrify it. So we had all this prime real estate downtown for 25, 30 years, didn't do nothing with it. Now white folks come down there and buying buildings for $50 and, 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 and reinvesting in them and opening up million-dollar condos and $500,000 lofts, and we mad about it. It's just been sitting there. Mm-hmm. You can't gentrify something when we own it. So that's the main thing. We have to separate ourselves and own our own communities. That's how we're going to combat this Donald Trump thing, because we can't get along with these people. When you got white folks that can blow black people brains out, can follow black boys home and, 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 and like a Trayvon Martin, Trayvon Martin did everything he was supposed to do mm-hmm. when he was walking home. He said, why are you following me? He kept walking. He got on the phone and called somebody. He said, I'm being followed. He tried to run away. The man chased him, grabbed him. He turned around, defended himself, beat George Zimmerman ass because George Zimmerman couldn't take an ass whooping. He killed him. Trayvon Martin didn't do nothing wrong. But an all-white jury, and that's another thing, these prosecutions, they are part of white supremacy too because prosecutions are, are, got all the resources necessary. And, 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 and they, these people, I went to law school. I'm a lawyer. They, go, they, they got all the resources. They specialize in putting people in jail. But you telling me you can't pick a jury that's going to put Walter Scott in jail that murdered a black man on camera and shot him in the back? It's a, it's a, it's a mistrial, and the only black man on the jury get a felony charge dropped during the trial, a homosexual black male that's moist, that's going all over TV talking about it was manslaughter, it was this, see, 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 stuff like that is what we got to look at. We are in a system that's totally dominated by white supremacy, and that's why I use that word. Now, do, are we going to we gonna let that stop us? No. But what we need to do is thorough organizing and look at what's worked. What's worked, whether or not you're a Muslim or not, whether or not you agree with a social philosophy or religious philosophy or not, the Nation of Islam gave us the blueprint. Mm-hmm. To this day, they're still the biggest black enterprise in the world. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Marcus Garvey gave us the blueprint. They each had a piece. Nation of Islam, the economic blueprint. Marcus Garvey, the Black Pride blueprint. And Nation of Islam, Black Pride bl- blueprint. Black Panthers, the military blueprint. To defend ourselves, protect our own communities. You know what I mean? And that's what we, ha- and that's what we have to do. And until we, and until we do that, you know, we're going to be in this same state. Because right now, as black men, we, we, in general, we're not men. In yeah. general, the black male is a poor excuse for a man in general because we can't provide for our families. Uh, look at happened, what happened to Sandra Bland. Anytime they can body slam a black woman on the, on the ground, hang her in her cell and say that she hung herself and just get away with it. You got a white cop in Oklahoma going around raping dozens of black women. Anytime stuff like that can happen, you, you, you basically a slave. Absolutely. You know what I mean? So that's what we have to do, and we need brothers out here that's not afraid. See, I'm not afraid. I'm not scared of shit. That's, you know, that's why I don't – most of my homeboys, I could probably be a lot further along in life than I am right now. I'm cut from the cloth where I could be a nigga in, 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 in the – I could have been in the Obama administration. I could have interned for a senator and been a chief of staff or, or, or used my gift to gab and my speaking skills to, to be a lobbyist or, being a, or be that token Negro making a million dollars a year in a Fortune 500 company. But all my homeboys is out the penitentiary. Why? Because even though they might not – be that educated i know that they have an open mind and an open heart to community revolution as opposed to a lot of these brothers who are educated who 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 did do what they were supposed to do on paper but what's the point of investing in a young brother and putting him in the best schools in the best colleges and educating him and putting a bunch of money in his education just so he can come home and reinvest himself in the white community by marrying a white woman Mm. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So it's not just about educating a brother. It's not just about school, because a lot of these young brothers that go to school and get educated, they get whitewashed. They go marry them a white woman and start expressing the same views of our, of our historic enemy and people that want us in a constant state of struggle. So it's not just about education. Education is fine, but education without community allegiance, education without race loyalty, you just as big of a threat as, 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 a, as, a, as a Caucasian white supremacist. Mm. So that's what it's about. We got to start educating these kids and give our kids an economic base. We fail in our youth because we're not giving them no economic base. These kids coming home, I'm, I'm getting sick of being at work and I'm on the phone and I, I let a kid use my phone 
and he talked with his little brothers and sisters, 15-year-old kid, y'all doing y'all homework, y'all making sure y'all clean up the house for grandma. Make sure when grandma, make sure you tell grandma when I come home, I'm going to start helping with the light bill. Make sure, you tell, make sure to tell grandma when I get home, I'm going to start helping out around the house. So when his brother come home, he's not thinking about going to school. Right. right. He's thinking about helping his sick-ass grandmama. Yeah. Or his sick mama. And the mama is so damn lost, she's complaining to the kid about having no money, which is basically emotional incest. So you put the boy in the mind state of thinking, when I come home, I got to be the man of the house and provide. Yep. Because we're not providing no economic incentive for our kids. And that's what it's all about, brother. We got we to gotta have an economic base. Because once we have an economic base, it's going to give these brothers the courage to say, okay, we got something out of our own. And we're going to do whatever we got to do to protect this. Because right now, they don't have an economic base, so they'll sell out themselves and their community just to get one. Mm. Absolutely. Um, that, that was, I don't have any more. You actually answered like three of my questions <laughs> that I have for you. <laughs> I'm just sitting here checking them off like, got it, got it, got it. Uh, right. Any final thoughts, um, comments, things you want folks to look out here uh, in 2017? Um, any work that you're planning to put out, any projects you have going on? Yeah, I have a media company, uh, Our Law Media. Um, we're going to be putting out the documentary, Don't Go to Prison, in 2017. We don't know if it's going to – we're going to do it as a series because we almost done filming. So we might just let out maybe a 30-part series, five minutes apiece. Um, but look out for the Don't Go to Prison documentary um, and the Don't Go to Prison initiative. Uh, people can go to www.elitebrothersister.com and, and um, purchase our clothes from our clothing line, Elite Brother Clothing Co., Elite Sister Clothing Co., and they can go to the same website and learn about the Don't Go to Prison documentary. And we also have a GoFundMe page up for the Don't Go to Prison um, initiative. Uh, all the money for the initiative is going to go to trying to purchase a building. We're trying to raise 300 Gs to, to purchase a building that's going to be used as the Elite Brother Elite Sister Training Academy to build black boys into black men, build black girls into black women. Um, and I'm getting sworn in uh, December 28th. Like I said, I passed the bar, so I'll be a practicing attorney after December 28th. And um, I'm gonna have a. And I got my website, MohammedLuwamba.com, where people can go to my website. Um, mothers who have sons that they need to get on the right path, they can call me and consult with me um, uh, for that. And lastly, just my social media um, at Elite Brother Mo is my Instagram. At Elite Brother Mo is my uh, Twitter. And on Facebook, they can just find me at Muhammad Luwamba. Um, and that's about it. Awesome, man. And congratulations on passing the bar. I know that's a Thank hurdle you. that a lot of folks can't get over. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah, man, you know, hey, you know, whatever you need, when, when this documentary is ready, let me know. I want to have you back on the podcast for sure. Um, I'm going to definitely be checking out your, your work. And I'm definitely gonna give me one of these uh, Elite Brother crew necks because I need I need that. <laughs> so. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And we're gonna be doing and we're gonna be coming out with the Don't Go to Prison hoodies um, next year as well, man. Because we just you know we want to keep keep that on everybody on everybody on everybody mind, man. Don't go to prison. Our whole goal is just to deplete the whole prison system of young brothers and and stop them from going in there, shut down all these juvenile facilities because they ain't gonna have nobody to be up in there. That's that's what we're trying to do. Absolutely. So there you have it, Muhammad S. Lawimba. Yes. All right. All right, bro. And that's going to do it with today's episode with Mr. Muhammad Speaks. I hope that you got some constructive information. I hope you got energized and I hope you're planning to do something constructive for the people that you care about. Um, and speaking of people that you care about, be sure to share this podcast with the people that you care about. Also, be sure to subscribe and tune in next week for more constructive information. This is what we do it for. We do it for our people to keep moving forward. And if you care about our people, you care about yourself, tune in and get that constructive information and be sure to share it with somebody. All right. All right. Until next time, everybody. Peace.